live long and prosper. I'm going to the Toshi station to pick up some power converters. Lilo Dallas Multipass. Shut up and take my money. By Grabthar's hammer. <laughs> what a saving. One does not simply walk into Mordor. X never, ever marks the spot. Winter is coming. You're a wizard, Harry. Stay a while and listen. Hey, old Kermit. Frog here. Your ties are cool. So say we all. This is a play on nerds. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to episode 101. Yes, that's 101 of a play on nerds. I can't believe As it. always, I am one of the co-hosts, Steve, and this other guy, Jarman, is the other co-host, <laughs> and we are going to co-host the hell out of this. Or at least, you know, half-ass it. I mean, we're both here for the ride. <laughs> we'll see what happens. That's right. Uh, but yeah, th- this week we will be going back to our back and forth reviews of Star Trek movies and Muppet films to scratch both of German and I's itches that in films disturbing. and culture. I know. That's why I'm saying it that way. <laughs> to make people at home also itch. Uh, <laughs> in weird places. That's right. Uh, for a weird movie, Star Trek Insurrection. That's right. Uh, the second to last <laughs> next generation movie. Uh, directed by Jonathan Frake, same guy who directed First Contact, and it's a lot to unpack. There's a lot that happens in this movie and a lot to talk about. Absolutely. So stick around. We're doing a lot in this episode, but that'll be our main section somewhere around the middle. So uh, we're doing a lot of fun stuff, though. But yeah. And in the meantime, German, what have you been up to since the last time we had the podcast? Well, uh, last time we talked about dads and got a little depressing in parts, but uh, luckily in between. When my, I thought we had a lovely we had a great episode. time. But my father passing away in between his that and the funeral coming up tomorrow, actually, is uh, I got to go to Dragon Con, which I had planned for yeah. the whole year. It's this big, huge, the biggest uh, nerd convention in the southeast of the United States. Um, and there was 80,000 people there this year. It's gotten that is so just big. incredible to comprehend. Right. Just inc- <laughs> to compare uh, San Diego Comic Con, the biggest one in the world, is about 120,000. So uh, this one's 80,000. Wow. It's, it's, it's gigantic now. But uh, so it's about four days of uh, panels and celebrities and parties, uh, all nerd stuff related. So I was going to do a little breakdown of what went on for my experience at con this year. Um, in years past, we've recorded interviews with people and stuff, but I, my mind wasn't really there for this year. But I did a lot of partying for yeah. sure. As I remember the last few years, uh, the interviews one year uh, you were boozed up. For cup for for a few of them, <laughs> of course. And the first year you were figuring out equipment still, if I heard correctly. Yep. You, we we couldn't understand a lot of it. So, <laughs> That's true. So I'm, I'm glad we're just going to do a nice clean recap this year. Yeah, and next year I, I'd love to do actual interviews, even on camera for the YouTube channel or something. That'd be fun, but uh, it didn't happen this year. And I'm still trying to talk Anna into letting me go. Oh, that'd be wonderful. It'd be so much fun. I'll keep working on it. You just keep knock, knocking at that. Put a lot of karma yep. in. <laughs> That's right. So you get there uh, on Thursday, and I'm wearing a ridiculous pink suit that I got for a wedding not long ago, an 80s themed wedding. Uh, it's bright oh, pink. Oh, the, the short suit thing? Yeah, it's got short sleeves and shorts <laughs> and a tie. <laughs> it was ridiculous. Pink, bright pink with black uh, palm trees on it. And for that, I went to an 80s dance party they had there and an 8 bit bash later on, which had an arcade and all, like, everything was 8 bit themed. It was really cute. Uh, and then. Party till about 2 a.m. Friday, get up, go to a fan discussion panel, which is pretty cool. Instead of having a celebrity panel, there's also these fan discussion panels where people who run that track will uh, talk about a TV show and kind of guide a discussion with the audience. We can talk and ask questions and just as fans, just talk about the show or movies that we like. So this one was about The 100, which is a TV show on the CW. Uh, which I would never have noticed normally, but my girlfriend got me watching it, and it's like post-apocalyptic with pretty people, and it's actually really fun, really smart, and fun to watch. Uh, so yeah, we just talked about that, and then I went to a film festival screening for fantasy films, uh, which they showed two short films. One was pretty crappy, one was pretty awesome, uh, but just two short films, and I missed about 500 things that I put on my schedule, because you just can't do all this shit, because there's too much walking around, and people, and People sightseeing and that kind of thing. Uh, then I saw Leanne Lord that night, which is a stand-up, a nerdy stand-up comedian um, who I hear a lot on the Star Talk podcast with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. 
So she was pretty funny. But a lot of uh, kind of rote jokes about, you know, uh, Empire Strikes Back being the best Star Wars, everyone cheers, like this kind of stuff that will get applause from any general nerd audience. So it's kind of, right. yeah, like, ooh, that was a really, you know, really challenging position you took on Star Wars there. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No one's going to question that. Star Wars TIE Fighters? Yeah. yeah. Does anyone here watch Lucky Star is? Trek? Yeah. <laughs> It's like Jawas. No, <laughs> I watched this little show called Deep Space Nine, and then yay! So it was <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> Firefly. Maybe you've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was exactly how it kind of was. Remember this? Well, Remember I, that? <laughs> when I was chatting with Nathan Fillion, anybody oh. heard of him? <laughs> 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 so then went to uh, see Aurelio Voltaire, which if you see him, he looks like a mix between a goth kid and a steampunk guy. And he's probably mm-hmm. about in his 40s, but you know, big black beard, dyed black hair, crazy eyebrows and steampunk goth costumes. But he sings like folksy, nerdy songs like Jonathan Colton or something um, or that band that you like. Uh, they, might be giants. they might be giants. Yeah. So you don't expect him to sing that kind of music, but he does. And it's it's totally fun and cute. Uh, huh. And then uh, rave dance until 530 in the morning which was pretty awesome. And you went with Patrick? Yes, Patrick was there with me. Uh, did he make it to 5.30 in the morning? He did that night, but uh, wow. <laughs> later on he wow. had a harder and harder time because he has, had a, he has a kid like you and he's not... Yeah, that, yeah. I, I can't even imagine that without like vomit on me. <laughs> that's a rave, I guess he probably is, but that's not the point. Well, the good thing is he's used to napping during the day because um, he works well, from home true. freelancing building stuff right now. He does a lot of building and, and creating, so... He'll be with the baby. The wife will come home. He'll sleep for two hours, then be with the baby till the baby falls asleep and has like kind of more erratic sleep schedule kind of thing. Huh. Okay. Which serviced him very well at Dragon Con because we would stay up really late. Then he naps in the afternoon and it's, it kind of works That's out. That's right. <laughs> uh, so Saturday, we're halfway there, uh, went to the Science of the Expanse panel, which is about the show The Expanse, which is really hard sci-fi, meaning that it's a show that is in the near future but tries to explain things scientifically so it feels realistic. Right, there's no science magic. Right, not like Star Wars, which is science fantasy more. It's more like hard sci-fi. So uh, yeah. it was hosted by Kyle Hill, who hosts the Because Science show for Nerdist. People might have heard of him. I, I used to watch his okay. show a lot. Uh, and there's also another scientist who works for um, Tested with Adam Savage. That's the guy who was from Mythbusters. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah, So there's, and then the rest of the whole cast was there. So they were talking to the actual cast about the scientific stuff that they learned being on the show and how they filmed certain things that were portrayed accurately, like gravity and how they had to move their bodies to be in actual gravity. And it's, it's kind of neat. Um, huh. So that was a great panel. And then I went to dub your own dating simulator, which is this dating simulator game. We've actually played on the, a play on nerds Twitch channel at one occasion where you uh, you're going to a school where you date life-size pigeons. <laughs> it was ridiculous. <laughs> Go. Uh. So they basically call people up in the audience to uh, read the dialogue in the game because it's not read in the actual game. It's just on the screen. And it was just totally ridiculous and silly. Um, but I, did, <laughs> I did not get called up. I was very upset because I raised my hand a bunch of times. But it didn't Those happen. bastards. They didn't know what they had. They didn't know. Uh, then there was a Heroes and Villains Ball, which is run by the video game track, uh, which we get VIP access to every year, me and Patrick, because we have a buddy who helps run it. And that's where you always meet the voice actors and stuff from video games. They hang out in the VIP room. So we got to see two of the Overwatch uh, voice actors and Mark Mir, who does the Commander Shepard for Mass Effect, was in there as well. So that was really fun. Very cool. Um, Just kind of generally heard them talking next to us, another group. We weren't actually talking to them, but I didn't want to bother them. But it was fun. As long as you touch the air that they touch. Yeah, breathing the same air. Uh, but for those of you who play Overwatch out there, it was the voice of Symmetra and also the voice of May. Uh, so very cool. Oh, cool. Actors. Um, so, yeah, and then rave till 530 in the morning again. So I made it out again until 530 in the morning. <laughs> wow. Good for you. So then Sunday, uh, the last full day of Dragon Con, uh, went to a panel where several voice actors from cartoons and games uh, come together and they'd read parts of scripts that were randomly picked for them from famous movies as their char- oh, character the voices. Kind of yeah, it was really fun. And something you'll appreciate, uh, Dino Andrade, I'd never heard his name, but he's actually the official voice of Speedy Gonzalez now for uh, Warner oh. Brothers. But huh. he, he also does the voice of High Tinker Gelbin Mecha Tork from World of Warcraft. <laughs> oh. He's like wow. the, the King Goblin, basically, not Goblin, um, Gnome, the King Gnome. 
Huh, so he very did, cool. He did the entire president's speech from Independence Day as the King Gnome from Gnomergon. <laughs> he's like, that is awesome. He'll forever be known as our Independence Day in Gnomergon. <laughs> and Suzanne, everyone cheered. It was hilarious. <laughs> um, and his Speedy Gonzalez was fantastic because he does the official voice. Uh, Spectacular. Yeah. And then with the vendor halls, which is three floors of crazy nerd paraphernalia, you know, a lot of it overpriced, but there's just so much to look at. It's just kind of fun to walk around. I, oh yeah, that's that's its own show. Exactly. Just looking at all the crap that's for sale. Um, I bought a pair of Golden Girls underwear for my girlfriend, and Hot. and a small uh, space ghost magnet. That's all I got. <laughs> I don't want to spend crazy uh, money. Yeah, we don't. When we ever we have gone to stuff, we never. Well, you know, what twenty bucks maybe? Yeah, 30. little trinkets, that kind of thing. <clears throat> yeah, but nothing real. I got a keychain last year. I think. I mean, it's, it's oh, fine. big spender. <laughs> Big spender. And then the late night panel I went to was uh, run by a voice actor named DC Douglas, who's been in a lot of video games, but not a lot I've heard of. But he's most well known for playing Wesker in the Resident Evil franchise. It's like the main villain or something. Or kind of, he's like their boss that turns into a villain. But people would send him in these fan fictions with his character having sex with other characters in Resident Evil. They'd send it in all the time. So finally he made this show where it's we he reads the fanfic uh, for the for the audience with music and sound effects and stuff, and he calls up fans to read the other parts. So basically, wow, he's, that's, yeah, that's fucked up. He's up there like basically having sex with people in the audience vocally. Um, and before the night was over, he had taken his shirt off at one point and made out with somebody who came up on stage, and it was pretty nuts. <laughs> so then, board games and chats with friends, uh, and then I raved till five thirty in the morning again. So uh, that happened. Wow, good for you. <laughs> Somehow, and I barely made it home, survive, alive and awake uh, the next day. And that's what I've been up to. So that's Dragon Con. <laughs> good job. Oh, and I went as Kung Fury one night for a costume, and it was a lot of fun. I ran to two other Kung Spe- Furies. Spectacular. Yeah, it was good. So what have you been <laughs> up to, sir? Uh, the only big thing that happened is that Anne and I went to a swank Napa Valley wedding. Ooh. That's right. A coworker who was on my team two years ago got engaged in... Man, they waited a long time to get married, but we <laughs> we went and um, drove up to Napa about two hours, uh, got up early enough that we got to get a drink or two beforehand, showed up to the wedding with a nice buzz on. Nice. The, uh, there were, the ceremony was five minutes, maybe oh, six. They're always so fast these days. <laughs> it was so spectacular. Neither of them are religious, so it was right. perfect. Um, funny. And that's the other part of the, 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 guy doing the officiating was legitimately funny which made it that much more enjoyable nice that is enjoyable he wasn't he he wasn't that guy who like thinks he's funny he he was funny Uh, (laughs) so then they usher us out for drinks and hors d'oeuvres get buzz on further go in and then they do the smart thing where they get the pictures done right away they do the first dance they do the toast and the cake and they get it done in like eight minutes (laughs) that's crazy that's really smart though And then it's just on to the rest of the wedding where we just got to drink and eat and then eat cake and DJ and and not stop uh, everything every hour to do a different event or a different cake cutting thing. Right. It was great. It was great. They grouped everything. It was really nice. Of course, they had a photo booth and that kind of stuff. Good food. What? Good food. Oh, yeah. Good food. Great wine because it was at a winery, which was real nice. Um, Stayed for a few hours, got the hell out of there, got home. It was great, but it was much more exclude. Like I was kind of surprised to be there. <laughs> I, I thought it was like, you know, 150 person group, but I, it was maybe 50. Oh, and I was like, man, we worked together like two years ago. You made the this cut. Is <laughs> this is, I made the cut somehow. And I wasn't even like a reserve invite. It's probably cause you're a fun guest to invite. That's true. I do speak well when drunk. It's <laughs> <That's> important. <laughs> uh, but no, that's what we've been up to. That's awesome. And, I think, and then the only other thing is that uh, Monday, and so we'll be celebrating over the weekend, is uh, my daughter Joyce's second birthday. Oh, that's crazy. Just insane. Two already years, two years old. old. Causing so much trouble already. So we're doing just a small lunch with a friend and Anna's mom on Sunday. Next weekend, we're going to go up to Anna's mom's place and do something with her family, we think. Nice. But yeah, we're going to keep it small and have fun. And we got a big box of presents from my parents. You can give her big birthdays when she's older. Yeah, she's not gonna remember. Like that's yeah. what four and five are for, right? Especially right now. Five. Right now, it's still for us. Five years old. I'm starting to remember things pretty hardcore. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's about it. All right, but, but, but with that, I think that takes us on to some nerdy news. Ooh. It's time for nerdy news. All right. Uh, do you want to go first? Or we want to take this one first. I want to apologize that blew out anyone's ears. Uh, that was a little louder than I expected. It, I mean, I was excited. It got me ramped up. <laughs> All right, you, uh, I can go first, I suppose. Uh, okay, got whatever you want to do. Two little small stories. Yeah, let's show off that that damn music. Um, <laughs> first one, just that I didn't even realize it, but Iron Fist season two is coming out today, as of Friday night that we're recording uh, this. That's lame. Why is that lame? Because Iron Fist is the worst one. It is. I agree. I mean, I still enjoy parts of it, but it was like the worst as far as like he's the most supposed to be the most badass fighter. And he was the worst uh, because they couldn't cover his face. So therefore, they couldn't use a stunt person who actually knew what he was doing. So Iron Fist looked really lame. Uh, yeah. But someone I know who works for Orlando Weekly, uh, he's on my on my Facebook feed. He already posted the review for it because they got an early viewing of all the episodes and he said this it was so much better than season one because they basically threw out a lot of things from season one and just made this for like a fresh start basically so mm-hmm. apparently it's a lot better so i'm excited to watch it it's only 10 episodes as well instead of 30 okay. usual 13 maybe i'll have to cut it some slack but i was not impressed with season one i was not either but i mean if you've watched all the rest of them might as well watch this one too that's what i say and, and your second story <laughs> second story is that August 16th, UFOs were photographed over Donald Trump's golf course in Scotland called Turnberry. So we must ask ourselves, <laughs> are they monitoring him for announcing Space Force? Or are they time travelers going back in time to see the golf course of the guy who caused the first apocalypse? Who knows? We may never know. I'll link in the article in our show description so you can see the pictures. They're pretty shitty. <laughs> <laughs> It is. It is definitely a cloud or a seagull. <laughs> the, what someone immediately kind of said was like, uh, "That's a reflection of lights in the window that are behind you," uh, which happens a lot of UFO pictures I've seen, like especially out of cars. Uh, if someone has the back light on in the car, or there's lights behind you in the hotel room, uh, it, it projects it forward. It's like an old ghost trick that magicians use, right? Here. And it reflects off yeah. the window, and it also it also makes a double of itself because the refraction. That's why there's looks like there's four UFOs that are in very tight formation. It's really just two lights behind you that are refracting. So, but really, and you're just real dumb. I just wish UFOs would take our president away to wherever they want to take him, or back, whatever. <laughs> yeah, take him somewhere that's not U.S. I don't know. That would be great. All right. So the cheeky name this week for my cheeky story is Hut All Up. Oh boy. And that's hut as in the huts of early hunter gatherer civilizations. <laughs> oh, I was hoping it was Jabba the Hut. <laughs> Jabba no Wanga. <laughs> <laughs> I love that little guy. He's fantastic. He has a name uh, too. He's like in canon book somewhere too. Yeah, let's not bother with that. <laughs> Anyways, derailed. So these like anthropologists and early sociologists were looking at um what starts child play and really what it comes down to is a lot of early play forms um, were in place of teaching because in early hunter gatherer civilizations, there were no schools. There were no books with lessons written down. There were no internet videos. There was only acting, doing and observing. Of course. So they had to train the children in different ways than they would other than schools. And so that's why they, they believe that games like tag started because it was a, a hunt and evade Oh, the earliest Build game stamina. ever. Right, right. Uh, hide and seek, same thing. Hunting from predators and searching. Makes sense. Um, play fighting. You know, kids wrestling around. It, you know, is them prepping just like an animal or prepping for larger encounters later. Right. And so they, what they started looking at is that, the, you know, these play forms exist in tons and tons. And if these single form plays occur, what about cooperative form plays and so they started looking at a hundred cultures hundred gatherer cultures from all over the world and of them 46 they could confirm had team sports at some point hmm. which would make sense um, too to practice to work together right exactly um and then of those that um had team sports 39 percent. those team sports were like ha- uh, had war play involved hmm. and in 24 26 percent of them uh, that it was child war play. 
Jeez. Starting young. Like like little like little kid battle stuff. Exactly. Um, but that it was the, they're now theorizing that that is where really team sports came from was from the coordination of the hunt or the coordination of the attack, you know, uh, tackling, checkling, uh, uh, checking, Ch- wrestling, chuckling, uh, th- <laughs> throwing something at another person. Right. Um, all of these became play forms because it was easy, easy teaching. It's funny that it was before, you know, they're teaching us racism at a young age, like with cowboys and Indians. So. We were all just That's one right. people. <laughs> There's no way to have to be racist because we were all yeah, it was just, just the same. It was just that that other village who we will take their pigs and women. Or like, oh, those are Neanderthals over there. We're homo sapiens, so let's beat them up. Yeah, and then we're going to interbreed with them for centuries. <laughs> yeah. As covered in, I think, last week's episode? Yeah. Probably, probably. <laughs> yeah. That's um, so yeah, that's, that's Hut Up. Nice. Or Hut Up. Yeah. That, that name is painful. I know. That's what I do for you. And now, since we're talking about Star Trek inter- Insurrection, uh, Steve is going to talk to us about insurrections in history. That's right. Insurrections or revolts, as probably as most people would know them. And I have a song um, for that. Have happened. Oh, you do. If it plays. <laughs> Live television, folks. Is it going to play or should I start talking? It's not going to play. So let's just do this. <laughs> okay. What was <laughs> it? It was dun, 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 Oh, that would have been perfect. Exactly. <laughs> Damn well, that's too bad. Oh, fuck. All right. So, uh, so I've got three U.S. rebellions. Gotcha. So the first was the biggest slave rebellion in the U.S. history, the Stono Rebellion. Happened in 1739. Uh, and there was sort of this perfect storm that happened where uh, I just heard about this. So apparently uh, in the South, there was this war, like I can't remember the name where a state fought the native Americans, just the state itself, uh, like the state, it's like South Carolina fought the native Americans. Gotcha. <laughs> and it, there was a war and they used a lot of slave labor in this war. So you had a lot of these older slave veterans from this war. And then all of these imported slaves from Angola were most of the train. Most of the tribes apparently were training with weaponry from very young age. Hmm. So suddenly you have this sort of this volatile combination uh, and it boils over, of course. So they raid a shop and kill the owners. Uh, and they, they rally a, a bunch of other slaves that are caused. And eventually there's about 100. And uh, they hold out for a week. And their goal is to get down. So this is crazy for me to think. So whenever you think of slaves escaping, you always think of them escaping to the north. Right. Uh, but in this case, their goal was to get to St. Petersburg, Florida. <laughs> wow. That's because... Weird. At the time, Florida was controlled by the Spanish, and under Spanish law, they were free. Oh, wow. So the slaves were headed for the south, believe it or not. And see, even when the Spanish came to the Native Americans, they didn't kill them on purpose. They just gave them cholera. Um, <laughs> and, so the, so the, and so the slaves held out for a week. They did eventually recapture most of them. A lot of them were held on trial for various acts during the time. Um, but it is believed... Uh, that a, a contingent did make it and did make it to freedom from this rebellion. Wow. So it's worth it. Yeah. Uh, so you've got the, the New York city draft riots, uh, which were pr- shown in gangs of New York. Uh, but really they went on for four days mm. and uh, they touched on it a little bit, but the draft had come out and the draft basically said, we don't want any black people in the army. And if you're white, you can pay us $300 and you don't have to come. So That's basically nice. four white people, <laughs> which were pouring in from every corner of Europe at the time, mm-hmm. were suddenly like just just screwed. Just screwed. You're in the war now. Um, so they went, they, they ambushed a pol- police commissioner in his office and beat him to death. And then they, they originally the mob was actually very targeted initially they were targeting these richer people that were um draft supporters mm. and it supported the effort to get you know this provision made where they could get out of it basically uh and but then it just got out of control and they just started just killing and pillaging just everyone with money or anything nice that's what that movie was basically about and that's yes and that is shown in the movie where it's like no we don't care our hate is indiscriminate we just want things and to tear things apart <laughs> right uh, but over the course, course of a couple of days, uh, uh, just under 100 people confirmed dead, surprisingly. Jeez. 
Uh, and then uh, the largest labor related rebellion or insurrection, uh, the Battle of Blair Mountain. So the Blair Witch involved? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, it's not going to be that interesting. Uh, in West Virginia, so coal mining country, back in the early 1900s, um, big coal was the big deal. And they owned huge tracts of land and people owned giant coal conglomerates. And these guys worked together and monopolized the market. It was a really shitty time. Uh, but they were totally anti-union, obviously, because they wanted to pay the miners as little as possible and give them no benefits. Of course. And there were thousands of miners running these operations. You know, tens of thousands of miners. Um, so th- things were tense. And to keep the, the, the pro-union guys in line, these, com- these coal barons for, uh, hired thugs and goons to go and beat people up and enforce laws and buy out politicians to enact laws um, and did really shitty things. Like while guys were at work, he would send guys to go and evict their wife and kids from their home. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. So one of the times they did this, this guy with the last minute name Hatfield, um, who was a lawman who was pro union, got gathered up some deputized miners and went and confronted this gang of guys who had just done this. Nice. And there was a shootout at a storefront and they killed them all. It became known as the something or other massacre. Can't remember. <laughs> um, and he becomes this folk hero to the miners. Mm hmm. Suddenly they've got this lawman on the side who's willing to stand up for what's right. And there's a string of. Um, sabotages and a lot of union minds getting sabotaged by non-union minds and a lot of really dirty play and things just boil and boil and boil. And finally Hatfield, the lawman uh, is headed to, I believe the capital or local local place where there's a courthouse uh, to, to show up to court where he's accused of, I think like dynamiting a mine or something, like something insane. And on his way up the stairs, he's gunned down. Wow. So they thought they were going to cut the snake off uh, the head off the snake. Turns out they just pissed everyone off. <laughs> this was exactly what the miners needed to finally boil over. He's a martyr. It started in this, this little valley, but eventually they were going town to town, rallying miners that are caused telling them what happened. And eventually there were as many as 10,000, they think one wow. said 15, but most of the reports I read said 10, 10,000 miners that were then on their way to the headquarters for all this local coal processing. So the coal barons freak out. They hire this ex-military guy to hire up a private army made up of like military vets and uh, miners who had switched switched sides. And they're they're able to gather up 3,000 men. The thing you have to remember is that most of these miners are are pretty fresh out of World War I. That's true. Most of them are trained soldiers who know how to use guns and solve combat. So they're super like it's really an army. That's margin, not just a, a bunch of rabble rousers. And that's the coal miner, so, the, the bad guys who are paying them to do this. What now? That's the bad guys that made the army, the the ones that were trying to. Yeah, yeah. The bad guys put together 4,000 guys right. to protect themselves. So, um, so they, they park near this mountain, this, these hills near this big mountain. Uh, and the, the, the miners have gathered for like one big final rally before the push. And the union leaders convince everyone, tell everyone, guys, we're going to get slaughtered because they had heard that they had put together this force, right. uh, we need to go home. And they called it off. So people had started to depart. These miners had started to head home after their bosses and their, cult, their leaders had basically said, hey, we need to stop or we're going to all die. This ain't going to work. So then, basically, not to say antagonize them, but that's the way it certainly mm-hmm. seems, the guy who is leading this, this other force starts killing pro-union people mm. in towns nearby. And uh, some of their families get caught in the crossfire. Jeez. Now, suddenly this army of pissed off guys who were ready to go home (laughs) are reignited and they go and they chase this opposing force up this mountain, Blair Mountain. Battle lasts for a few days. The, The president actually threatens to send the first wave of bombers, threatens to drop a gas on them. Uh, and about a thousand guys die. They think, wow. Over the course of the days. Uh, and then over the next year, something like another thousand are brought up on charges for what happened during. And so this is like uh, 1930s, 1920s. This is, this US? Is the early 1920s, the early 1920s in the South. And like uh, the, the Hatley Hatfield guy was assassinated in February of 21. But like, okay, in the South somewhere, cold country, what? Uh, West Virginia. 
Oh, yeah. That's, and that's the Hatfields and McCoys, too, is a big thing in that area. Maybe. maybe. I couldn't find any connection like right. that, though. You might be tangentially related or something. Possibly. Um, but, yeah, and so it set back unions, and it actually did its job because unions couldn't get back on track for another, like, 15 or 20 years, almost. Wow. that's crazy. The, the coal barons really did break that, break West Virginia for a long time. But we got to get back those coal jobs, according to our current president. <laughs> That's right. They're coming back. So important and so healthy and like a great just idea. Like Justin Timberlake's bringing sexy <laughs> back. Uh, but yeah, so that's some, some historical American insurrections and revolts. That's fantastic. Hopefully you learn something. And now to unlearn something. <laughs> our coverage of Star Trek Insurrection. Insurrection. Erection. Is that not the right? <laughs> so, as you were talking about popular insurrections of the past, I have to ask, what's the difference between an insurrection and a rebellion? I have no idea. Also, what insurrection or rebellion happened in this movie? Uh, none. And now we're going to talk about that. <laughs> we're going to talk about this self-indulgent piece of crap we watched. <laughs> so hold on. I'm actually going to look up live on the air what the definition of insurrection Direction actually is all Let's right see. so while jarman is doing that i'm going to start talking about the movie wait here it is a violent <sighs> uprising a violent uprising against an authority or government did we see any of that in this movie no there was none <laughs> the only insurrection mentioned is the the rebellion of the people that were eggs up that's the only insurrection that's, that's mentioned true. but we can get to that later right that we does, can talk that, about that later. they could justify that i suppose they are the so let's insurrection. Just, let's just talk generally about how we felt about this film. Sure. Uh, as I said, directed break, by yeah. Jonathan Frakes. Uh, I have felt this way about this movie for years. Watching it again today made me reaffirm that, that it's just a really great episode of Star Trek. Yeah, I guess. Like a good two-parter. Yeah. It's uh, not... Uh, <sighs> I, I feel like we're we're accustomed to make every movie that's sci-fi or fantasy have huge scale and consequences and stakes. And this didn't have that. It has the stakes of 600 people. And that's it. Um, and the ethics of feder- the Federation at stake as well. But yeah. it's not a blow up the entire universe kind of stakes. So I think people are just like, this is boring and stupid. But like, right, right, it, was, but- it had great character moments, great acting, uh, a lot of you know, a great story, a great idea for an episode. So, I mean, uh, it was a great two-parter. Hey, to, to counter your point on that. Sure. Save that shit for TV. <laughs> the non-stakes TV thing is, for TV? TV is where you have to pull your punches and not mess up the timeline. Movies are where you're supposed to go all out and where you're supposed to go big. And the funny part it, is, is that this was actually written originally as an episode and then never happened. And then they changed it up a little bit for the movie. So that makes sense. It makes a lot more sense now. <laughs> um, but yeah, not terrible. I mean, it was watchable. It was clear. You knew who everyone was. There was no weird giant plot holes or anything strange. Everything led A to B, B to C, C to D. No big twists. I mean, except for the whole Sona being the, you know, the Baku people. But uh, no oh, real yeah, big twists. Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, totally watchable. I'm not going to say it's terrible. There were some really just bad moments, just some bad moments, but we'll get to some those. cheese ball moments, some cheese ball over the top self-indulgence moments. Right. Um, and some moments where I was like, why, why did, why? <laughs> and once happens right at the beginning, we'll talk about it. Um, mm-hmm. Overall, not a bad Star Trek film. Some of the originals I think are worse than this one. I totally agree. I would say like five and maybe six or we're definitely five, maybe six or is worse <laughs> than this one. This is much more easily watchable, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, not bad. Not my favorite. <laughs> well, that's good. That's like, I think it's a general reaction to most people from direction. Some people just hate it and think it's god awful. But No, I'm going to save that for Nemesis. <laughs> which I remember liking a lot too. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. I haven't seen that um, one in a long yeah. time. So we'll see. Um, so let's talk about the movie. So we start off uh, in this you know, nice okay. kind of medieval village, Renaissance era. I- idyllic, beautiful yeah. weather, children laughing and beautiful playing people. as they run through through bountiful fields filled with harvest as artists work on paintings and 
people joyously clean, you know, kind yes. of stuff. And then we pull back and all of a sudden we see a uh, high viewing deck, a high hide. I think they call it in hunting. They use yeah, that high word. Hide. And that's a good that's a good term. Yeah. And they had a federation with these weird Sona people with their strange stretched skin over their faces watching and observing this area. And then we see that we have Federation people undercover actually on the ground in Invisa suits that we've never seen before in Star Trek. Um, and all of a sudden and they can you can see them with thermal vision. It's a it's a neat little construct yeah. they put together that, that kind of framed the opening nicely. I was pretty surprised. That one little part of the window that has the thermal vision on it. And so they'd walk past that. You could see them as soon as they go past that part of the window. You can't see them anymore. That's kind of neat. And nobody on the ground can see us. Pretty cool. For 1998 um, effects. That's pretty, pretty good. All of a sudden phaser fire erupts Mm -hmm. there's you can see through the this the vision that someone is running from two others who are chasing them and shooting at him and we find out it's data gone wrong okay 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 so we uh (laughs) this this movie this moment honestly started the entire movie out on a really bad taste in my mouth i put good hook what's wrong with data i put that in my notes like no no you're absolutely right okay data was the perfect they just put him on the fucking hook wrong. Like he was the perfect bait. But why did they need to reveal it was Data before he ripped his hood off? That's true. It was. Bu- it would have been so brilliant if you had no idea who that was. And then violence, and he pushes someone into a lake, and then rips off his, and all of a sudden there's Data. And you're like, why is Data attacking all these Federation people? Right. And they cut to credits, yeah. That's they true. fucked that entire opening by revealing that it was data. And it honestly started me out with such a bad taste in my mouth for this film. It does make that whole sequence just less exciting. It's still interesting, but it's less exciting for sure. That's right. right. And I understand they wanted to give him time to say his like booting subroutines. <laughs> awesome. Like they wanted time for them to hear that. I think there could have been plenty of time for that if they had waited. He could have taken the mask off and then said that line. Right, right. And because you took the mask off and you were focused on him and you were blown away, it was data. The line would have been that much more impactful. <laughs> they fucked it. They That's fucked true. the whole I didn't think about that, movie. but that would have made it a lot more fun. J- Jonathan Frakes fucked it. He did. <laughs> or screenwriter <laughs> and or both. Um, everyone and or everyone fucked it. <laughs> so they basically have accidentally messed up with the um, prime directive by revealing themselves to this supposedly primitive culture. So that's a big problem. And we don't know who these Sona people are. They're really creepy and weird looking, but they're apparently work with the Federation. Uh, but then we get back to the ship, back to the Enterprise, and we see it's a totally different part of the the, the, the uh, solar system at that point, galaxy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Captain Picard's getting ready in all their dress uniforms to go meet a delegation of this weird alien planet. Is that the first time you get to see them in their dress uniforms? That dress uniform. That's a new one that they okay. used in... Uh, I think that you might you might use it here first, and then it bec- they show it in Deep Space Nine and Voyager later on. But it was the first time okay. it was shown because the old dress uniforms look different on the TV show and stuff. But gotcha. Uh, but yeah, they're, I like them though; they're pretty cool. The white ones, I like. So, them. so here was my impression of it, and I and I literally kind of kind of chuckled. So everyone, I thought looked really great. Like I thought the dress uniforms were so cool. Yeah, me too. Everyone's walking in formation, and they all had really nice lines. And then they pan around and there's Worf and next to him is a short dumpy slouched over like that actor should be slapped in the face slouched over Vulcan with a bowl cut that all of a sudden they all look like waiters. Oh no. (laughs) (laughs) Out of nowhere. He took what was a very regal scene and then they all looked like help because he looked like a stooge. He looked like he was wearing a waiter's uniform suddenly. (laughs) Well also made them all look there should be no dumpy Vulcans. Basically every Vulcan is in perfect physical condition. That's the way it always has been, basically. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Um but yeah, they get their worse there. He's back from Deep Space Nine. And the, then in the case funniest you didn't part. Back, he mentioned it again later. <laughs> but the funniest part was he says, Commander Wolf, what the hell are you doing here? And then Worf's about to explain and he just cuts him off and they move on. It was like so funny because they don't ever really explain why he's there. <laughs> it's like an ongoing joke. He has to appear for these movies suddenly because I'm here for the paycheck, Captain. <laughs> Understood. Walk away. <laughs> But I, I I laughed out loud at that line because I, so I, I couldn't remember how they put him on the ship again. And they just don't care. He's he's here. Just deal with it. <laughs> uh, and then they go and they, they meet this delegation from this new planet who just discovered warp drive a few years ago. And then that's when they kind of said they load up the gun of like, yeah, now that we have so many alien uh, enemies in the universe, we need as many allies as we can get the Borg and blank. And the you Dominion know, and, they, and the Cardassians. Yeah, they, they they load this this pistol for you. 
Well, the big thing is that's been with Worf too, is that the episode that airs basically right before this movie comes out, um, his wife on the show, Jadzia Dax, is murdered by a Cardassian because of this war going on and all this other stuff. So he's in a bad place. And they even cut a scene in the movie where he wakes up from a nightmare about thinking about his wife that died. But then they're like, eh, people might not have seen that show. They're just watching this movie for the movie, so who cares? Um, but yeah, all, all this crap is going on in Deep Space Nine, so they have to like factor it in a little bit with canon, but it's not really important for the movie at all. <laughs> uh, okay. And so they just gave him that crappy puberty subplot. <laughs> right, his gorge. <laughs> My gorge is acting up. Um, so they get a call that something's wrong with Data. Jordy gets a call. So he runs the data and they want his schematic sent. They do agree after he has a phone call with who is obviously a shady admiral. Admiral Doherty, I think it was. Like, you don't trust him for a second. It's always a bad ab- admiral. Oh, it's always a bad admiral. <laughs> Including Kirk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's just, he's Kirk. Uh, so Picard makes some bullshit excuse if they head out anyway after being told not to come check on data. They get there and data has escaped. And is crazy and firing on people and <laughs> just being insane. And him and, and Picard and Worf have to go and get in a shuttle and go disable Data. And he's on his way to a planet. And so in order to distract him, they start singing Gilbert and Sullivan tunes. Uh, which, but, is, which was really fun. It was fun because apparently Data had been practicing those recently, which goes along with canon because he's constantly trying to learn plays and music and stuff. So... It was it was cute, and they're both good singers. They're all good singers, actually. So, and they they, they are able to attach with data, data ship after a near crash. They're able to disable data, beam him out, or get back, whatever. And they take him back, and they try to repair him and run some tests on him. And apparently, some of his memory subroutines have been screwed with, or messed up because he had been shot by somebody, attacked. Yeah. So they go down to the planet. After they basically reveal that, uh, you know, they're here to study this planet and the briar patch and the special energy that's in this part of the galaxy and that the what the Sona are there to, to study them, blah, blah, blah. The Baku who are on the planet. And they've made an agreement with the Federation to share technology. And they talk to the Baku <laughs> on the planet and find out they're not just medieval people. They've just given up technology, but they were post-war big time. They're really, they have a lot of technological knowledge. They just, they just, want, to, they just want to live peacefully. They're super smart. Uh, they, they're basically reverse aging, effectively. Right. They reveal that, like the guy reveals, oh, I was quite a bit older when we came here. Physically, that is. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so they start retracing data steps. And they realize that he came from the lake. Is that right? Yeah, they get strange readings from the lake. Data's there with them. And then he, he walks into the water, which is a great kind of moment. We'll walk by the fish and he taps a fish in the face. Um, but he finds that there's basically a um, disguised a Federation vessel there. Or something down there. And yeah. they go inside and find out it's actually a giant holodeck ship that's going to trick the Baku into going to the ship and not realizing that they're... Uh, they've left their planet when they think they'll, they'll think they're still in their village and they'll take them somewhere else and drop them off so that they can take over this planet. Them. Right. <clears throat> right. Putting the Native Americans right. on a reservation, basically, which is right. bad. And so Picard's not having it. He heads back up. He conf- confronts the Admiral. Surprise, Admiral already knew this shit was going down. <laughs> it's only 600 and, people, Captain. And. And that's when it, it comes to the whole like we need this tech. We have a lot of enemies in the in the galaxy, like we said earlier when we loaded that gun. <laughs> right. We have to make this deal to get their tech, and it was such a flimsy. <laughs> that is what got me. Not the low stakes, the flimsiness. What of haven't the we learned from the past? Relocating people of minority. How many people do we need to have before it's wrong? A thousand? A million? Ten million? A million. <laughs> Um, so here's something really interesting. So I looked on, I think it's called memory alpha prime or something. Memory alpha and then memory betas for the book universe. Yeah. yeah. Um, and looked up the Sona and there's a surprising amount of information on the Sona. Hmm. So it mentions about how they took on, uh, the, the, uh, God, the Borg and, um, how they took over all these colonies and took slaves. And you know the other aliens that are there servicing them? Yeah. 
those are two pre-warp civilizations that they took over. Oh, crap. Well, that's before, that must be from the books then. No. Okay, so here's the best part. So I'm reading all this, and I'm like, man, where did all this come from? This must come from the books. And then as you mentioned, no, this is Memory Alpha. Um, and I look, and in the movie, there is a one-page data sheet that they look at that has information on the Sona. Like, they're literally looking at an information sheet on the Sona. Oh, Riker is, and yeah. And someone took the time to type out an entire real information sheet on the Sona from that one little page he's looking at on the screen. Somebody paused it and took all this information. That's fantastic. I need to read that. And that is how all of this information that is not in the movie at all is in the Star Trek universe because some writer or intern or God knows who (laughs) actually (laughs) made something up to put on a screen. And it totally makes sense because they would have left that planet uh, because they wanted to embrace technology and then they would go not having any ethics to learn from uh, or prime directives just go ahead and take people over who were lesser than them and oh and there's this evil whole thing jerks. about how um when they were trying to f- uh falsely replicate the the energy you know artificially replicate the energy uh it caused that the experiment caused a terrible mishap that made them all go infertile uh and also probably look like the way they do no so the the, the way they do is because they're all like 250 or 300 years old something gotcha. like that um that's why they look the way they do and that's why they have to get back to the planet. Right. Because they are infertile and the only thing like that will it. let them get back. But apparently there is a much larger empire of them. How's that? If they're all infertile. So, uh, well, it's because they, you know, they, they weren't always infertile. Uh, it was like 50, 50 years ago, supposedly. Gotcha. They became infertile and that's when they started having to figure out how to get back. Yeah, because there must be a lot of them if the Federation is dealing with them. It can't just be like five people. Yeah, yeah exactly. This is just the contingent that was set back to 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 do this. Right. Probably some of the OGs, the originals. And not only that, but the two people that hated the planet the most, like the people with the most motivation to be there. True. But yeah, they're a much bigger empire. And all of this is because, as I said, some intern <laughs> <laughs> took the time to write something on a screen. Right. Well, they probably worked with the writers and other people and canon people to make a story about them. That's fascinating. Maybe. I hope. But it's still cool. Still very cool. I like it. So, not, but mind you, none of that is in the movie, guys. Right. Well, it's in the movie for a split second. Yeah, it's all inferred a little bit here and there and that sort of stuff. Well, I mean, I thought you were saying it was from a screenshot from the film where he's looking at that one screen of about the Sona, about who they are. Yeah, it's true. So it's on the screen for a second, you said, right? Yeah, yeah it's there. Right. So all this happens supposedly, but you know, nobody can read that. <laughs> right. That, that fast. No, yeah. If you, if you can, no, if you see it, it's like four paragraphs. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane. Um, so <laughs> I'll have to go back. Uh, so when data, uh, is they fix him on the ship and he says, I see, <laughs> I see you missing several memory engrams. And then they hand, they show him the actual physical memory engrams. He's like, Oh, there they are. <laughs> Just, it was on that moment. <laughs> Um, but this is when everybody who had visited the planet is starting to see the effects of the strange energy radiation around this planet. Uh, for some reason, Worf starts going through puberty again. So his hair's growing longer. He gets pimples. Yeah. That, that was really kind of weird. I wasn't a fan of that. Uh, Picard starts dancing the mambo as soon as he goes into his quarters, which is really silly. Uh, <laughs> Jordy gets his eyes back. His vision comes back. Or he has vision for Every, the first time. Everyone feels younger and better and more vibrant. And uh, um, what uh, Crusher talks about how her and uh, Troy talk about how their boobs are firming up. <laughs> that's right. You can tell the script was written by a man. Uh, um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, so all these good things are happening. Uh, so Picard says, "No, we're gonna. I'm gonna tell Starfleet. Right? You know, I can't let you do this." They so now forces their hand, says, "We're gonna go ahead anyway and start deporting them. We're not." We, we're not going to even put him in the hollow ship. We're just going to put him in cages, basically. And they start attacking the Enterprise around the same time, too. Yeah. So Picard sends uh, Jonathan Frakes, the director, away, which <laughs> is great, to get to the edge of the Briar Patch to send a message to Starfleet. While him and they take the like uh, the something yacht, like the captain's yacht, the captain's yacht, uh, down to the planet to help the Baku because they're sending drones down to teleport them out. Right. So they shoot them with a little dart and that makes them get a tracker and they can teleport them out. So at least they're not just killing them all. I mean, that was kind of considerate. Yeah. Yeah. They at least had that going for them. Uh, so they 
the, the they try to get the people out into the mountains. The idea is they're going to get them into the caves and protect them. And they shoot down a bunch of these drones in the end. Uh, who John Luke and what's her face get taken. Oh, there's a love interest for John Luke in all of this. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, what's her Anij? I think her name was, uh, I don't know. She also, I found out uh, plays mother Goffel in the, the tangled movie. Ooh, she's a great singer. Um, see, so yeah, he's got a love interest in there somewhere. Uh, that happened. Uh, <laughs> and, but then there's a moment that that's really weird and they don't come back to it and they don't explain it. And there's uh, hit Picard and this woman are sitting by the side of a waterfall. And he, they, he basically tells her that he likes her, and she holds his hand, and like time slows down. Right, and he's like, "How did but you?" But not do that? like figuratively. Literally, time slows down. <laughs> so maybe being on this planet long enough gives you powers. Like it is possible. Well, she had hinted at it before, saying, "Have you ever been in a moment of time where everything stands still, and it lasts forever?" And he's like, that one time I saw Earth from the first time from space. But then they go back later. She actually was being serious. She could just stop time and make it last forever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so that was weird. And later on, he uses the same power on her. When the rocks fall, he stops time and says, she goes, see, it didn't take you that long to learn how to do it or something like that. So that was, huh. I guess I didn't notice that. Yeah. Things slow down so that and all of a sudden he looks up and crushers there because he had like. I don't know, somehow manipulated time to where she would be, she would live long enough for Crusher to get there and help her. It was weird, but it, was, well, it went by really fast. <laughs> yeah, that happened too fast. Okay. So they go through a cave collapse, they get out, but then they get taken anyway. They get darted. <laughs> so suddenly Picard and this lady are back up on the ship with the Sona, the Sona captain. I can't remember his name. Um, That's weird. He uh, takes the Starfleet officer who uh, Admiral who finally says he can't go any further and he throws him in this chair and stretches his face skull. It's really bad CG. And he immediately dies for some reason. Yeah. He doesn't scream. He screams for a second and his face splits apart and then he's gone. I don't know how stretching your face and his eyes, kill you his eyes stretch. I don't know how that happens. His <laughs> eyeballs stretched. Um, but uh, so now the sonar are just doing what they want. They're going to deploy this sail thing and capture all the energy and wipe out all the, pl- the life or something. I don't know. It gets real convoluted at the end. And so in order to trick them, he finally gets the other one sonar lieutenant guy to say, this isn't you. You don't want to kill these people and take away their planet. You could see your mother again. Uh, so he convinces him to help him to somehow they make them all get into the holodeck ship by beaming them without their knowledge into the holodeck ship. To where they think that they're actually still on their bridge and blowing up the um, the belt the that has all the power. Oh yeah, uh, and they find out they're actually not, and so there's a um, he beams him, the the Sona captain beams himself onto the thing that's going to blow up the ring, and he fights with Picard on there. Uh, Picard stops him, and at the last minute they beam Picard out before the whole thing blows up, and they save the planet and save everybody else. Yeah, uh, one. So the, the the second lieutenant guy that you mentioned that Picard talks into it, mm-hmm. fun story also from this back, you know, information. Uh, he is actually the lead scientist that was doing the experiment that made them all infertile. Oh crap! Well, there and you so go. this is how he has to like pay back his species. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, but back. yeah, uh, f- uh, fun thing. Uh, F. Murray Abraham, Oscar winner F. Murray Abraham plays the the villain. And he was also at the beginning of our last Muppet film, Muppets from Space, where he played Noah. That's right. In that opening scene. The very last film we watched of this series. Um, so, yeah, that happens. Uh, and they get away. They end up leaving Baku. They don't stay. Jean-Luc goes on to be an eternal bachelor. Yeah. He never even kisses her in the mouth. Uh, I mean, I guess it's, a, it's a PG movie. I get it, but come on, you can kiss somebody uh, in the mouth. And, and somewhere in here, okay, comes. I don't think Jonathan Frakes indulged himself at all, like his character in First Contact. As the director, I do not think he gave his character any lean or any spe- big special moments that other characters didn't get. This this movie, <laughs> when he tells the Enterprise to eject the manual steering. <laughs> Oh god, that's a little the PC like joystick. <laughs> a, yeah, and a PC joystick and then he's steering the Enterprise with it. We've never and had he's that leaning before. And being right, right, right. I was like, "Jonathan, you self-indulgent piece of shit." And then putting himself in a bathtub with Troy where she can shave him while he delivers his lines. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but I was like, oh, you self-indulgent son of a bitch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to so fly the Enterprise by hand. By hand with this 1998 joystick <laughs> used to play Rogue Squadron on PC. <laughs> <laughs> and Flight Simulator. <laughs> Oh um, man! But he was but great. He was so of, smarmy in this movie. He was like smiling half the time, sarcastically. Yeah. Um. But yeah, everything's so the movie once again not bad. Clean beginning, middle, and clear villains. A little love story in there. Some right. teenage angst with Worf. <laughs> Data getting closer to becoming a human. There's a whole subplot with him and a little boy that we completely skipped, which is kind of neat. Uh, and one scene I really loved was. You get to see like the Oscar caliber acting from Jordy LaForge um, that LeVar Burton can pull off from like Roots and that kind of thing when he was seeing his first sunset. Like I was almost tearing up a little bit. He was the way he's delivered his lines was so great. Um, yeah, it was good. So that was a really good scene. If it, I and he's the one that they send back to show Starfleet because they'll see that his eyes are fixed and know that they're not lying about this planet. Did they say that? Something like that. No, I didn't even catch that. Huh, nice. Um, so other stuff about the Sona, now that I'm remembering. Uh, they are all riddled with terrible diseases because they are at the end of what their genetics and advanced science can do. Gotcha. Uh, they're constantly like pumping themselves full of toxic antibiotics and stuff to fight off these things. Uh, and then additionally, they reveal that they need at least 10 years in constant in the concentrated energy of the briar patch to reverse what has happened to them. I did hear that mentioned real quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And there was some uh, kind was of alternate per- ending. Perfectly serviceable movie. There was apparently an alternate ending that was either thought of or not quite shot where F. Murray Abraham's character was going to blow through the ring by accident and kind of crash on the planet. But all that direct exposure to the the substance makes him de-age really quickly. And so you're, you're going to see a human-looking F. Murray Abraham uh, at the end of the movie, but they, they decided to scrap all that and just blow him up. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, so that didn't happen. Yeah, blowing him up was pretty good. And the thing throughout the movie we talked about a little bit before when we first started was there's a lot of cheesy lines, especially from Data, of all people. He does a lot of facial expressions that are really human throughout this. And he doesn't have his emotion chip in, so they, they didn't play his character very well. In a lot oh, of yeah, parts. they did mention that he left it. Yeah. But did they ever establish that they reinstalled it for him? I mean, he typically doesn't put it in. He doesn't like it. Um, so... But I don't know. He had like facial expressions like the one time when Riker shaves his beard and he says smooth as an android's butt. And he's like, excuse me. And then later on, he's like, Riker, may I? And he grabs he rubs his face and he goes Mm-mm. like he makes that face. He doesn't say anything, but he's like, mm. and just like it's a very <laughs> human thing of like, no, nope, not as smooth as my ass. And like, what? Like he wouldn't do that. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. So and then also data going over after hearing the women talking about their breasts being firmer. Uh, uh Worf is saying something about the effects of the radiation. He's like, yes. And don't you feel that your breasts are firmer as well? And <laughs> it was silly, but it's like, he, he wouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah. That's, it would, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Agreed. Bad. Very much so. Um, but no, not as bad as some. Worse than a lot. But right right in the middle. If anything, insurrection from a full Star Trek canon point of view falls right in the middle. I would agree with that statement. Um this is the first of only two Star Trek films not to feature any scenes on or near Earth. Uh, the second one okay. being Star Trek Beyond, the most recent one. Uh, Jonathan Frakes wanted John DeLancey to reprise his role as Q, but this never panned out, much to Frakes' disappointment. Uh, Marina Sirtis admitted that she fell asleep during the film's premiere. That's Deanna Troy. Fell asleep wow. during the premiere. <laughs> uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the first choice to to be offered the role of Ruafo, which is the main villain. That, what? That would have been so stupid. <laughs> that would have been such a different movie if he was physically imposing. Yeah, I guess like Picard and him having a giant fight scene at the end. That would be really stupid. Maybe. I don't know. All right, this is a little bit longer, but I found it interesting. Um, according to a leaked manuscript, Fade In, The Writing of Star Trek Insurrection, written by Michael Piller, the screenwriter of this film, mm-hmm. um, Initial concepts for the film were far removed from the final product. The first script treatment, called Star, Dr- Star Trek Stardust, involved Picard and a fellow cadet named Hugh Duffy, who were friends at Starfleet Academy back in the day, meeting up after almost three decades because of different circumstances. Duffy has become a renegade who has tried to provoke a war between the Federation and the Romulan Empire, and Picard must travel to the neutral zone to bring him back. 
Picard eventually finds Duffy and risks his career to help the other officer thwart a plan by the Romulans to take over a planet housing the Fountain of Youth. So that's the only common thread. Uh, okay. At the end, Picard gets arrested and stripped of his rank by Starfleet due to his actions during this film. Uh, so the plot was similar to Heart of Darkness and featured numerous references to various episodes of Star Trek Next Generation. So that would have been a whole different movie and a little more serious probably. Um, or maybe not. Wow. Well, but totally different. Yeah. Uh, Anij, the female guest lead, was originally offered to Sally Field. That would have been cool. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and this is the best part, which ties to our podcast a lot. Admiral Doherty was originally offered to Wilford Brimley. <laughs> Diabetes. <laughs> I'm Admiral Diabetes. And, and Gene Hackman was also asked. They both declined. Good for you, Gene. <laughs> So a little trivia for you of this movie and all that. Instead, stuff you did Welcome to Mooseport. Good for you. That's his final film. He never did anything after that movie, so he's just been. That's it. Oh, I'm Ray Romano. That's his legacy now. <laughs> so with that, that has been Star Trek Insurrection. Insurrection. <laughs> All right. For you naysayers out there, that's actually the from the soundtrack of this movie. That's the end credit sequence. That's not just the next generation theme. So now we have a little bit of a game called uh, Techno Babble Improv, which we have not played in a while. No, not a long while. So this is a game, if you haven't heard it before, where I give Steve a little bit of randomly generated uh, techno babble from very much Star Trek sounding. And he has to improv a response to that as if he were the captain or engineer or someone else in the ship. And you'll get bonus points, Steve, if you can tie it into the movie we just watched. Oh, my God. You don't have to, but you get bonus points uh, if you do. Let me see. <laughs> so we got a long episode going here, so we should do three of these. Get it going out okay. kind of fast. Uh, but uh, I'm going to randomly generate some techno babble. All right. I'm detecting a compression gradient in the passive banger. That's impossible. The passive baller doesn't have gradients detection. We must be receiving a signal from the coolant tank next to it. Make sure that Ensign Porter checks it out. Ensign Porter, but I'm his superior officer. Exactly. You're going to rub my feet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's randomly generate another one. Uh, stand by while I re-attenuate the electro-ceramic ram capacitor. Well, hurry up. We haven't got all day. The relay capacitor better be calibrated next time for inter interplanetary transmission, or I'll have your ass in the brig. The brig? I haven't been court-martialed yet. <laughs> no response. I will cut your space rations. <laughs> nothing. Space rations. That I'll, sounds like a thing. I'm going to defriend you on Facebook. Ships that they eat as full meals. They established that in one of the movies. It's canon. <laughs> That's true. Scotty eats it. O'Hara brings it to him when Space they were rations. having love. Yeah, random, randomly in love in that last movie. Ah, Lassie. You're a great woman. <laughs> it's so weird. Weirdest, worst couple in the world. Um, All right, okay, here we good, go. Good last one. Last one. one. There we go. Okay. If we depolarize the optronic density power core, it will increase the efficiency of the atomic matrix. Oh. The atomic matrix can't take us beyond 12 gigatrons of power. We have to re relay down to the Baku if they're going to last in the mountains. Where'd you learn that? The Daystrom Institute? <laughs> no, I went to Phoenix Online. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, my throat. I killed Jarman. Ow. I don't know why that hurt my throat so much to laugh at that. <laughs> I learned that at Phoenix Online and then played the music for Phoenix. Phoenix Online. And I, and I got my degree in TV VCR repair. <laughs> Administrative TV VCR repair. Child care. <laughs> Automotive repair. Dentistry oh. assistant cleaning. <laughs> <laughs> well, that has been uh, Star Trek. Techno babble improv for your listening entertainment. <laughs> and and now, now we have something else. 
It's time for Jarmer to stretch his brain with a little bit of Would You Rather. Oh, yeah. We always got to have some Would You Rather. That's right. All right, Jarman. I've got three doozies for you. All right. Let's, let's do it. All right. So, would you rather have a dancing bear that has to go everywhere with you for the rest <laughs> of your life? So, if you go on a flight somewhere, you have to make arrangements for this dancing bear to come with you. <laughs> he is always there. I'm not going to say he's like always with you, but you can never have more than like one wall between you, let's say. Okay. Like that, like that kind of, he's always around. Is it an actual bear or like a teddy bear? It is a, a giant dancing bear. bear. Right. He's not dangerous, and I don't want you to think you're transporting a grizzly everywhere. It's not like a giant, tr- like, but it's a good sized bear. All right. Or would oh, you have Lord. three functional legs? Um, three, three functional, functional legs would be the one. Yeah, it's a lot less trouble than a dancing bear falling everywhere. I'm gonna go with dancing bear because that's built in economy right there. You think? He go on television, do movies, dan- anytime people see a dancing bear. And he's got to be with you because he goes everywhere with you. So right, right. And he's tame. Like in this, he's not like a wild bear that mauls me all the time. Well, he's a dancing bear. Then I was hoping there's some benefit to my third leg. There's no benefit. You're a freak. <laughs> You're never going to be able to buy normal pants. <laughs> You're always going to have to buy two right shoes. All right, dancing bear. Yeah. Hey, dan- <laughs> <laughs> Anna also said dancing bear. <laughs> All right. Would you rather be Gandalf or Dumbledore? Uh, I think Gandalf has more raw power and is he's uh, funnier and has less responsibilities. <laughs> See, I went, I, I went the other way. I went with Dumbledore because his magic is much more expansive and encompassing versus even though, like, you know, Gandalf is basically a demi- demigod. Kind like of. Effectively. Kind of. Yeah, you know, um, and you're right, raw power, but he's limited. He's like light and smoke and fire. Oh, he can do so much more than that. No, no, no. I mean, they, they established that that's like his realm. Kind of. No, in the book, they not kind of. That's they established that in the books. That's his realm, like light, shadow, and like fire. That's why he shoots the light out of the thing at the the flying things. I feel like he can do a lot more fire, like parlor tricks, than that, though. Maybe, but like, you know, you, you've seen how powerful like witches and wizards in Harry Potter can make magic do anything. It's true. It is very helpful in everyday anything, life. Anything, including raw power. Like you saw, like, did you ever see Gandalf like throw around a snake made of fire and then make it attack someone? No. <laughs> he threw around like smoke and made it do that. <laughs> So yeah, that's why I would double doors because I think the the magic in Harry Potter is much more flexible, so to speak. True, and I feel like they could be like facing off against each other, and then just Dumbledore could just throw a pencil at him with his mind or something. That's and throw right. Him off, but I still uh, want to be Gandalf because I think he's cooler. <laughs> all right, so here, here's the last one. All right, would you rather? Uh, you can no longer talk out loud. Hmm. You can talk telepathically but you can only talk to one person at a time for the rest of your life. Right. So one-on-one brain link with someone, not the same person. It could be anybody, but only one person at a time for the rest of your life. Or you can never speak to a single person again. You always have to be speaking to more than one person if you're going to speak out loud. So there's only one person in the room. I'm just unable to speak. Yeah. You can communicate elsewise. elsewise. I'm not saying you can't. I'm just saying that like, you know, when you're uh, alone with the, the with the woman you love, you never again be able to tell her out loud that you love her. You can have a one on one link with her. Uh, I'd prefer the still being able to speak out loud, but only to multiple people at once. Because then, what if I'm by myself and there's nobody there? That wasn't covered in the contract. I don't know. Because that's I, tough. Then I, right. can, then I can still be a voice actor. <laughs> that's true. That's true. You still have that option then. Would you you just to- have to always make sure there's more than one person listening. <laughs> right. Eventually. Well, the thing about this, every time that you recorded, though, you would have to have two people in the room with you. Well, I, I thought if there's nobody in the room, the rules wouldn't apply then either. I could still talk. I didn't think this all the way through. <laughs> I was trying to find the loopholes in these. <laughs> all right. So you, you're going with the speaking thing. I'll probably go with the telepathy thing. Because think about how hard interpersonal relationships would be like. 
I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah, deaf people have uh, relationships all the time. It would really limit like what you could do for work and stuff, though. I learned sign language. That's right. There you go. All right. We've got a way around it. We're good. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> would you rather conquered? And that means... Uh, trailer reviews. You might need volume for that, Jarman. Pump it. Here at A Play on Nerds, we have spent years refining our exclusive trailer rating system. At the low end of the scale, we have Don't Waste a Match. This movie is so bad that I wouldn't waste a single match to burn it Fahrenheit 451 style. And second from the bottom, we have We'll See. Maybe the trailer was too short. Maybe it was cut oddly. Or maybe we don't know what the hell we just watched. Up next, we have Give It a Buck. Whether you hit a red box, a dollar movie theater in the bad part of town, or a cheap online rental, give this movie a buck and enjoy it without breaking the bank. And at the top of our rating system, we have Shut Up and Take My Money. The wallets have been charmed out of our pockets, and we are ready to make our hard-earned cash disappear. And that's our patent-pending trailer rating system for A Play on Nerds. Man, we talk a lot. And we sure do. <laughs> and we're going to talk some more. Which trailer do you want to do first? So first we have one that's, uh, I almost called you Scott. I don't know why. <laughs> but well, That's what my downstairs neighbor calls me. Weird. <laughs> you're just growing. Yeah. You're, you're turning into a Scott now. That's just what you Almost you're, continuously. You got to live with it. So the first uh, okay. trailer that uh, Steve sent my way was Beyond the Sky because it's about aliens. Let's play it here. Yeah, play it here. I was abducted the first time the day I turned 14. Seven years later, they came for me again. What I want is to know why. I'm a documentary filmmaker. I decided to disprove one of the greatest myths of this century, the alien abduction phenomenon. You're a skeptic? Well, I am a reporter. Which ones are the ones that allegedly abduct humans? See, that's it. That's the light. Can you see it up there? Coming stronger and stronger, and then... No one here actually knows the truth. But all I know is that something's been happening to me. So do you still not believe in aliens? Well, of course I don't. Why, do you? Last night, something happened to us when we were driving home. They want something from me. We get our fair share of non-believers, but sooner or later, they come to realize the truth. So you're saying that this is an extraterrestrial? Absolutely. Sky people will come to you, will take her. Don't want anything to happen to you. Why do you care so much? I don't know. You were chosen for your great cause. Oh my God. It doesn't matter where I hide. They always find me. Need you to wake up. We're all were abducted. Beyond Bam. the freaking sky. Uh, so this one looked right up our alley. And actually, I was looking for trailers a few days ago, and there was just no, it was just terrible no man's land right now. Right. And then yesterday I refreshed, and out of nowhere, this one was there. I was like, oh, thank God. There's <laughs> something we can talk about. Um, it looks interesting. It doesn't, it's not found footage, which I'm grateful for. Right. Thank, he's making a documentary, but it's not found footage. Thank God. I, like some, of, some of the footage. some of it's like yeah through the eye of his documentary so it's kind of like right, right true but, but it's, most of it's just regular narrative uh, straight up do- filmmaking yeah right, right. No, nothing that's like hey we're making a doc like in the nose sort of stuff like showing the camera guy and that kind of shit uh, <laughs> and um, it looks okay I wasn't at first I thought they were leading this like well maybe it is maybe it isn't but as you get further in you're like nah aliens exist in this film. That's what I'm saying. I wrote my notes too. Is that like they're straight up in the trailer show you an alien ship and aliens walking around. So unless there's a a hook or a what do you call it a, a twist where it's like actually government agents giving people like acid or making them hallucinate, which is very possible. They make you they trick you in the trailer to make you think, oh, it really is alien. But then in the movie you realize it's really just like people fucking with people. Because there is a big psychological well, part of this trailer where they're and, showing and, people in therapy and stuff. So who knows? And honestly, when it starts with her saying that, like, they, you know, first time I had was, you know, when I was blank, immediately I thought, like, oh, she's a sexual abuse victim, victim, and this is the narrative. And then seven years later, they came for me again. I'm like, oh yeah, that's the sexual abuse victim, like 
That's true. They were the way they were playing. Like, Right up in front, and then immediately it's like, no, go, yeah, aliens aren't real. And then the more they show, they're like, oh, yeah, the aliens are definitely real. <laughs> it's, it's, I just didn't – I still think it could go a weird way. I'm with you. I think they could hook it. And I would be totally fine if there was actual aliens. This, they just didn't show it all in the trailer. So that's, that's why yeah. I feel like either they were dumb and showed it all in the trailer, which made you lose interest, or they did that on purpose to misdirect. Um, yeah. So it could be either. Uh, but I'm going to give it a uh, give it a buck. If nice. it shows up on iTunes for cheap or maybe at Redbox down at the 7-Eleven, maybe I'll pick it up. But I'm not going to go pay any money to see this. Frankly, that being I'm said, it's I'm releasing surprised. in theaters and iTunes on the same day. Nice. Uh, it's from a small production company, so that's probably why. But um, I'm surprised that you're giving it a buck. the quality looks good. Yeah, it does look good. And I recognize that Russian dude. He's in a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I said give it a buck as well because I wouldn't see the theaters. Yeah. But I, I love watching alien movies of any kind, especially alien I knew I knew it would be right up your alley. Yeah, absolutely. And this week we have another movie that's also right up German's alley. <laughs> Halloween. The kind of not reboot. A remake, not a reboot, really. In between. A sequel. I think a le- like a legit kind of sequel yeah we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it um 40 years ago on halloween night they're literally gonna tell you what happened three people after that horrific night he was sent back to the institution in captivity i have prayed every night that he would escape did you do that for so I can kill him the bus crashed Michael Myers escaped he returned to Haddonfield his home I need to protect my family you have no security system Karen mom you need help evil is real there's a reason we're supposed to be afraid of this night I've been preparing for this for a long time. It is not safe to be on the street tonight. Go home! Get out of here! Get inside! Michael! He's here. Oh, I always love that music. Yeah, and I thought they played with it well at the beginning where they didn't quite hit it. All the notes were there. Right. They didn't quite hit the rhythm, and then midway through, it was like, yeah, this is what we know. So officially, this movie is pretending, pretending that none of the movies happened but the first one. Um, they've ignoring all of them. But that canon does not exist in this film. It, that's officially been said. Uh, so it takes place 40 years later. And Laurie, from original movie, Jamie Lee Curtis, has been training and ready to kill him her whole life. So she's kind of like a Linda Hamilton kind of <laughs> character. I don't know. Right. You're right. Uh, but it's cool. I mean, that's kind of a neat aspect of it. But uh, what do you think of the trailer? Um, I don't know. They're playing on this nostalgia hard strings. Uh, Mike looks big and scary and ominous. He looks like he's not going to be quite the like drooling, slow simpleton he has been in other films. He might be a little <laughs> bit more aggressive and more sharp. I think. Right. Um, I don't know the the Jamie Lynn Curtis having being like a war lady. You know, like a hardened getting ready but also somehow had kids and raised them well in the meantime like it just all is, <laughs> doesn't true. quite add up <laughs> like they're in her daughter's house and Jamie Lee Curtis lives in a really nice house and her daughter's house which also very nice but somehow she's been like an insane kook collecting guns and waiting for Mike to come get it that just does, it doesn't add up well it's kind of like every movie and TV show it's like how do they afford that beautiful loft apartment and they have no job in New York City <laughs> like <That's> right. what <laughs> They sleep with the landlord. That's the answer. <laughs> it must be. <laughs> so uh, I'm talking about Joey. <laughs> of course. I also wrote that uh, it looks like fun and I love all the Halloween movies, but I never I never saw the Rob Zombie 2 reboot films or whatever. Um, but at least I understood why they made the Rob Zombie ones because it's a fresh approach to this franchise. I did. And I, I've seen it. And it is a Rob Zombie film. It has this exact dark gray filter grit that you're expecting. And it does good homage and good service to the original. Truly. Right. And at, at least it makes a there's it makes a whole different artistic approach to the series. Whereas this looks like it could have been any of, of the three through six that they made. 
Oh like, yeah, absolutely. The, the quality looks about the same. The the technique. The, this could be the one with the rapper where they're trapped in that house and video cameras. H two O. Yes. This could be that one. I think she was in H two O. Jamie Lee Curtis was in H two O. Her character dies in that one. She um, gets hit off, knocked off a cliff. Uh, so that's why this definitely isn't in the same canon uh, or right. universe. I don't know. Maybe if Michael can survive over and over and over and over and over again due to the rune of Thorn, maybe Jamie the Akernis also carries the rune of Thorn. <laughs> and I'm, so she has to kill her closest blood relative every Halloween, which is also Michael. There you go. I think I made up a fan theory right there. <laughs> Holy I, shit. I forgot that, that you had seen so many of them. <laughs> but uh, You've seen too many of them. You said it wrong. <laughs> I think it's going to make it so it's more like he's he's just human. There's no supernatural effect. Um, the first one, he gets shot he's, and falls off the the, the, the building, uh, the house, the second story, but then he's gone. But someone could have possibly survived that. Um, we're right. And isn't there one where she thinks she's killing him, but she accidentally kills a guy that had the mask on and Mike f- runs free? And that's how six ends is like him getting away ultimately. Well, a lot of the other ones, he gets shot multiple times, stabbed. He should be dead. But well, in the end of six, I saw Paul, uh, what's his Paul face, Rudd. beats him to death the length of pipe. Right. It's like, But in the first movie, the one that they're only counting is canon for this movie. He's just shot and falls off the second story, and he could have survived right. that. Uh, which they say, uh, they then captured him and put him in a sane asylum, what they're saying for this one. So I'm going to give it a, give it a buck. Once again, this would be great come Halloween time to rent. Absolutely. Check out. But I... I cannot remember the last time I went to go see like a horror film in theaters. It's just they're never at the top of my list because there's so few good ones that really grab me. And theaters are too expensive nowadays and going out with the babies is an ordeal. So Exactly. You got it. But yeah, I, I did say give it, give it a buck. Cool. All right. So that takes us on to some radical, radical recommends. recommends. If you have the means, I highly recommend picking one up. What do you recommend I do? I recommend Pleasant. All right. So uh, my recommend this week is a show that also came back on Netflix just uh, the other day, which is Ozark Season 2. Oh, um, that gets thrown in my face all the time, but we haven't checked it out. Yeah, and it stars uh, Jason Bateman and Laura Linney. Um, and it's basically, think of um, Breaking Bad, but in the Ozarks. Um, and so, okay. but with Jason Bateman, also a comedic actor who also gets thrown into the life of crime, does not want to be in it, but is stuck in it with his family. So there's a lot of parallels to, um, Breaking Bad, but instead of like the Mexican cartels, you're dealing with all these like hillbillies and rednecks in the Ozarks. Okay. So um, it's a different flavor, different flavor, but also great cinematography, great acting, mostly dramatic, but some comedic moments, but it's Jason Bateman being doing serious acting um but it's just as captivating crazy interesting characters for the first time six since hancock was he that serious in hancock i don't know i'm just making that up the whole movie was a disaster <laughs> but laura linney i've loved since uh she was in that um Tr- truman show truman show she was great also that movie Congo. the one with um the whole ensemble cast love actually that's what i was thinking of sure she was great in that um congo i'd forgotten all about <laughs> Never forget about Congo. But if you haven't already watched season one of Ozark, I highly recommend it as far as like a dramatic series. You, you won't okay. feel like you want to jump into it because it's hard to jump into dramatic series. But once you do, you're like, oh, crap, I got to watch all the episodes. How long are the episodes? Like 40, 50 minutes sort it's of thing? like 50 minutes. Yeah. Like, um, okay. And then it's like, I think uh, 10 to 13 so it's a longer episodes. Form. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, yeah. What do you recommend this week? So this week, my recommend is twofold because I kind of discovered two things simultaneously. Mm. Uh, and I talked to you about both of these. So um, my D&D group is falling apart a little bit because people are having children. God right. bless them. We're all we're so happy for them. But it means that we're going to have a couple sporadic play months sure. while they're having the kids and getting settled down and stuff. So rather than try to like really strictly continue our main campaign, um, we are, are Keaton, one of the members of our group, has offered to host Dungeon World sessions in their place. Right. Um, and so I was introduced to a gaming system called Dungeon World. It is loosely based off another system called Apocalypse World, uh, which has much more simplified modifiers. There's less dice rolls. It is more story centric than math and logistics. You don't measure how far you run on anything. It's so much easier. Um, and to get ready for it, 
she recommended listening to a podcast. Uh, so I have to make a really bad confession here. <laughs> okay. So while we, while we make this podcast, we made 101 episodes. This will be 101. Um, besides listening to one episode of the Rusted Robot podcast. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> when, when we were going to have them on and I needed to know who they were. Right. I have never really listened to another podcast. Do you not have like a very long drive into work? Well, I do now. So, yeah. So, um, I wonder what you listen to I, on the I, way to work then. Just music I, I or radio? To radio? Yeah, a lot of music and stuff. But okay. I discovered this and it's a, a game master and three players. The game plays beautifully with three, which is awesome. Nice. Um, and What's they're, it called? All com- they're all stand up comedians from Canada. And uh, it is friggin' hilarious. And it's called. Uh, it is called Spout Lore, S P O U T L O R E, which is the name of one of the moves in the game where you can basically roll dice to see how much you know about something and then say something about it. Nice. Um, but the thing I really, um, I-, I can tell you is that I've played three, five, and five, uh, and played with a couple different groups, and I have never had more fun playing an RPG than I had playing Dungeon World. The first session because it's so story and role playing based, basically, it is so story based. Um, you, you said you were surprised, but you know, a lot of it is asking the the DM doesn't have to prepare as much because a lot of it is what the players create. Nice, like you guys are heading to a town. Uh, Glyph, you're from this area. What town are you heading to? And then a player gives the town name. He says, "Oh," and then you know the wanderer. What's it look like? You, yeah, you. You've heard of this place from where you're from. What do you know about it? And you build the world as you play and you build your relationships with other characters as you play. And as you build and as you make your characters, you guys decide on bonds that you have with each other that they get you over the awkward. How do I feel about other people in my party? And you don't have to plan it all from the beginning. You can kind of build it as you go, which is nice. Less daunting. Right, right. And you base it and you have to make it make sense based off the relationships that you have with these people. So in mine, I was an old retired mob enforcer, a big guy <laughs> named Teeny Tom Hardy, uh, Teeny Tom Parker, Teeny Tom Parker, um, who six foot eight. And what I realized after I designed him and I fell out the sheet is I made his hands like his signature weapon, essentially, and they're brutal. And he uses them to break bones and enforce things for the mob. And basically, I built Wreck-It Ralph. <laughs> so the, the entire session, I basically, my dumb voice for him. That was the other thing. I wanted to pick a character I could have a good voice for. I basically did a John C. Riley impression for my entire character. <laughs> That's right. It was real good. It was real, real good. That actually came up with Dragon Con. Patrick's been talking for years about making a giant Hulk costume that would be like eight foot tall, basically. Oh, and, I remember him talking about that. Yeah. And I we made the joke that he should like say the wrong catchphrase all the time. And so... <laughs> Just walk around and say like um, it's clobbering time, or I'm gonna wreck it. You know, like say just say the wrong just to piss off nerds everywhere. <laughs> yeah, idea. I'm uh, I'm Teeny Tom Hardy. Uh, <laughs> I've been living here for a long time. Uh, I like what I do. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound exactly like Wreck It Ralph. It's it, yeah. It's a, uh, John C. Riley is probably one of my better impressions. I don't get to do him often. <laughs> I found that people that have a similar mouth type to you. Is who you can impersonate well in ge- people in general. I'm saying. Well, so. here's the thing. For me, most of my impressions start with me finding how I have to hold my mouth. That's the important part. Because you know John C. Riley is kind of all out of the left side, <laughs> and you kind of close up the right a little bit. <laughs> he's so weird of a guy, <laughs> and he used to be such a serious actor. Now it's all comedy. He's yeah. He's been nominated for Oscars. I think back in the day, man, he was a serious actor. Now he's just like, I want to have fun. I think he got nominated for best supporting actor for Chicago, if I remember correctly. And that might have been the, the last, like, more serious role he did, too. Yeah. And now he's doing a, uh, a Sherlock Holmes movie with Will Ferrell that I'm so excited oh, for. Oh, boy. I had not seen that. It's called, like, uh, like, like Holmes and Watson. Or something. It's so good. It's going to be so good. Oh, I'm boy. so excited. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my Rackle recommend is twofold. It is Spout Lore, which, um, honestly, there have been times where I have lost it in the car laughing to these guys they play so well with each other the characters they draw are hilarious there's a barbarian who fancies himself a poet that is just great um and the i just got to the end of season two and the last episode like left me like shook the conclusion because just because of where they left it and what happened 
And it was really good. And I think the whole thing is like built by these guys playing is genius. Well, then do me a favor and at some point check out Dungeons and Doritos because you mentioned Dungeons and Doritos. They are fabulous. Same kind of deal. It's people playing live action role playing, but they're or not not LARPing, but uh, playing role playing game. In uh, person. Yeah. And with, by this thing, they do a beautiful editing with sound effects and music and they cut off the There's stuff. That's a kind of little filler. bit of this. A little bit. Right. But not much. But either way, it's a lot of fun. So both these uh, podcasts, check them out. So Spout Lore and then Dungeon World, the gaming system, I cannot recommend it enough. You do not use a single D20. It's so refreshing. I'm going to try it out. I'm excited. The role system is based off a of 2D6. Nice. And I can yeah. probably DM that at some point. Oh, yeah. And it's the first game where I've, I've played where I'm like, hey, I could DM this. That's true. Without going insane. <laughs> I'm trying to think about the random topics we've had this episode. We've talked about 12 minutes on Dragon Con, 10 minutes on Dungeons and Dragons, uh, about 20 minutes on a Star Trek movie. I, I think this uh, might be one of our ner- nerdiest concentration episodes. We've covered a lot of stuff. <laughs> Very this is a niche. Dense, stuff. We're, we're like a neutron star of just podcasts. We're so dense. It's so true. Ian Cohen, let me know if I use that right or not. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Uh, so that brings us to our thank you section. Yeah. Thank you for being, being a friend. Yeah. Travel down the road back again. Heart is true. So happy. And a confidant. And a confidant. And you threw a party. All right. Well, first of all, I want to thank once again, uh, Paul and Sean for sending in their lovely recordings for the last episode or one. Yeah, episode. that was so nice. Thank you from great. you guys. Uh, and on Twitter, we had a couple more congratulations, which was really nice uh, from Mike Crate or at Jarek, who's been listening for a long, long time. And always, oh, yeah. For he always forever. tweets about when he listens to our episodes. It's so cool and fun. Um, he just said simply, congratulations, guys, on the big 100. And that's fantastic. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Keep listening. We'll bring you another hundred. That's right. And Daniel Hitch, another longtime listener and author. Check him out. Bubbles the Pirate. Uh, he says, so many congratulations. Great episode. And I can't wait to see your dad's, your dad's life as a Netflix show soon, German. Um, <laughs> when Steve made the Sorry Raw Julia Ref and the Ad- Adama Michael Caine impression, I <laughs> laughed out loud on my walk to work. <laughs> so, Mark Caine. Mark Caine. Um, oh, Adama. yeah. I love Michael Caine. I love Michael Caine. <laughs> Michael Caine's a great guy. I like him a lot. Hey, aren't you John C. Riley? Uh, I think I've heard of are you. The, uh, I like the Cylons coming? Uh, I think the Cylons are here. I think you're a Cylon, actually. Well, I might be. <laughs> I'm always called me 14. The, the way I got to check that is I have to put my fingers up your ass. <laughs> there it goes. I'm done. <laughs> Watch out, Will Ferrell's already up there. <laughs> Pretty much. Damn. Yeah. They and attached. <laughs> lastly, we have to, uh, Steve reminded me of this, thank my mother if she ever listens to this episode someday in the future because she liked one of our posts about Burt Reynolds dying to the other so day. I know that I'm sure Karen has liked other posts that I just haven't noticed, but she is the only person that liked the Burt Reynolds dying post. <laughs> so I specifically noticed it, Karen. So thank you. Thank you for putting up with our potty mouths during this episode. If you ever actually listen, (laughs) I just talked about putting fingers up your butt. So I don't think you've ever listened to this episode. Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Uh, Just put them up there slow. Uh, I don't like that. Don't put your fingers up there. It's not All right. And with that, we cap off another brilliant episode. This has been Star Trek Insurrection Review. And now we're into a new generation of both Muppet films and Star Trek films. Uh, we have one no, more Star I Trek film. Because we have to watch Muppet Wizard of Oz between now and then. And, and Star Trek and uh, mind, Star Trek Nemesis as well. <laughs> so wait, are both of the worst things from the franchise going to fall back to back? I think so. Oh, this might be a, a dismal two episodes, people. <laughs> It'll Buckle be fun. In. It'll be fun. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us for a long, ultra mega packed episode. Uh, We will keep bringing you all the nerdy fun that you can handle as long as you keep being our nerdy audience. So thanks again, Internet. Stay nerdy, my friends. Oh, and that means I have to actually play the outro. (laughs) 
It's play. Why isn't it play? Because I have the vault. Once again, I mean, stay nerdy, my friends. Check us out. Oh, there we go. Thank God. <laughs> I'm leaving that in. Damn right you are. Thanks for listening to A Play on Nerds. Thanks. Find all of this content and even more nerdy news, reviews, and energy? fun at www.aplayonnerds.com. Be sure to Man. like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter so you know the exact second we release new podcasts, articles, and other nerdy content. <laughs> we know you're impatient. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Podbean, Buzzsprout, Podomatic, and whatever the hell else you use. Also, please leave us a rating and review on your chosen podcast platform so we can be discovered by even more nerds like yourself. However you do it, check us out. And how. Uh, I think we're done. That's it.